but there is enough sea out here so that perhaps Lieutenant Colonel Stafford might be thwarted in his hope to stay with the spacecraft and board the Wasp within Gemini 9. The story on the flight deck now to Don Blair. We're standing on what is probably the busiest piece of real estate in the western Atlantic and probably the windiest right now. As Bill Ryan said, the prime recovery group is airborne. All that is except for the three swim helicopters which do that close-in job of picking up the astronauts with the frogmen and the photography team. They go off about 20 minutes before the expected splashdown. The primary crew is in the air. Contingency aircraft are within my vision at the aft of the WASP flight deck and ready to take off whenever the occasion arises. This is Don Blair on the carrier deck of the aircraft carrier WASP. All planes on the way or ready to go. It is uh, Tom Stafford's uh, intention to stay aboard his spacecraft and ride it right onto the deck of the WASP. He'll undoubtedly do that uh, unless, as uh, Ryan suggested from out there, the waves are so high that it's uncomfortable to stay aboard or if they're too far away. If they're within that uh, four to seven mile range, they almost certainly will stay aboard because uh, Stafford uh, takes great pride in uh, the belief that he can do that. He did uh, with his command pilot, Wally Shira on Gemini 6, rode that spacecraft aboard. And if you remember, that was with the first uh, live television pictures of recovery, also from the WASP and relayed by satellite and uh, the beautiful picture that we got uh, of uh, Shira and Stafford smiling and giving the thumbs up signal at the first moment that their hatch was opened aboard the carrier. We're hoping we have that kind of a successful landing this morning and those sorts of uh, wonderful pictures. The, uh, uh, once they're aboard the WASP, incidentally, they are not going to stay a couple of days as they have been doing in recent flights, but they're only going to remain four or five hours and then fly on to Cape Kennedy for the rest of the medical and uh, the flight engineering debriefing. These have been busy hours since 4.15 when these two astronauts awakened this morning, Stafford sounding a little sleepy but getting right to his chores. Not only do they have to prepare for retrofire itself, but they've got a lot of housekeeping chores up there in space. And uh, with the retrofire about uh, five or six minutes away, we have time uh, perhaps to go out to McDonald Aircraft in St. Louis where Dave Schumacher and Bob Sharp are occupying our mock-up uh, spacecraft. And perhaps Bob can tell us something about those housekeeping chores this morning. Dave, Bob? Well, Bob, uh, you're a fine fellow and all that, but I'm getting tired of this. Get me down. <laughs> all these uh, uh, storage, of course, is a real problem in a spacecraft. We uh, uh, work real hard to stow every item in a particular space. The chest pack, for instance, is stowed overhead in the rack there, along with all the camera and photography equipment and a uh, special box. Uh, each uh, piece in there fits in a, a uh, ideal location. In other words, you can't put anything in backward or just one fit. Do you have and to spend a lot of time, incidentally, rehearsing how you're going to stow things? Uh, yes, there's a uh, mock-up review that uh, on each spacecraft where the prime and the backup crews come in, uh, look it over, ar arrange their own initial storage there, and then we, we design it to uh, an individual mission's uh, uh, requirements. And, of course, the astronaut's uh, uh, preference where that's a, a uh, factor. Now, what are we doing right about now up in space? Uh, just prior to retrofire here, they're within, I think, about the last five minutes right now. So they have... Uh, gone down, activated their RCS system, or the reentry control system, tested and checked it out uh, here. They're getting ready then to uh, separate the adapter, uh, which will occur 30 seconds prior to retrofire. So here they've, uh, uh, at 30 seconds prior to it, they'll separate the ohms lines, which cuts their fuel oxygen lines. Uh, next, they'll cut their uh, electrical wires, and then they will physically separate the uh, adapter and then fire the uh, retro rockets on time. Bob, um, there has been some, uh, I suppose criticism is too strong a word, but in checking the objectives of the mission versus what was actually accomplished, do you think there's any reason that uh, Tom Stafford should be disappointed in this flight? Uh, no, not at all. I think this was a uh, tremendous mission. The three rendezvous that were accomplished were uh, uh, very, very good in the fact that they depend uh, uh, more on uh, pilot or crew ability than anyone's uh, previously. And uh, so, uh, the, especially the, the third one, the one from above there where the target was uh, 
where the target was uh, below him and hard to see. Okay, Walter. And it's now some uh, four minutes until uh, retrofire. And CBS News color coverage of the recovery of Gemini 9 will continue, of course, in a moment. New from Standard Brands. Soft blue bonnet margarine. Soft enough to spread on a potato chip. And Blue Bonnet did it to demonstrate a great new margarine discovery. New soft Blue Bonnet. So soft it spreads on anything. From thinnest crackers to softest white bread. Just taste that great Blue Bonnet flavor. And it's low in saturated fat. Two table service tubs in every pound. Everything's better with Blue Bonnet on it. Here's a loaded question for men only. What will it take to get your wife to use Chasen Sanborn coffee? Say it's got He-Man flavor, that it brews up a storm, it's full of beans? Ha! Huh. All she has to do is try us. Because if she hasn't tasted our coffee lately, she doesn't know about the extra flavor in instant Chasen Sanborn. A new heftier blend. What's the heftier all about? She'll find out. And so, uh, Stafford and Cernan, Gemini 9, are just about uh, getting in touch with the Canton Island Station, as our Colesman map shows us, that they're out uh, beyond Australia and on the way to that area uh, near Canton Island, at which they will fire the retrofire rockets some uh, two and a half minutes from now. Let's see quickly what uh, is going to be happening out there, so you can orient yourself as you hear from the spacecraft itself. Uh, there, the capsule uh, is on its way, of course, uh, and uh, preparing for the first stage, the uh, retrofire. This animation uh, shows it to you. First of all, they have to turn the uh, blunt end uh, forward uh, because that's the end the heat shield is on. Uh, they then uh, will uh, jettison uh, the so-called equipment section of the uh, spacecraft. That was that section in which uh, the uh, Cernan Road, then the firing of the retro rockets, 2,500 pounds each of each of these thrusters. They fire four of them sequentially, as you see here. If they don't fire automatically when the, when the uh, spacecraft is in exactly the position necessary, then the Stafford can fire them manually. Then they blow the retro fire package, as you see there, and now this is the part of the spacecraft that comes back. Those are the control rockets. Uh, the uh, re-entry control system which positions the spacecraft the way they want it as it enters the atmosphere at some 400,000 feet high. Uh, it is still going 17,000 miles an hour at that point and of course there is that burn off of the ablative heat shield around the spacecraft as they get down uh, into the atmosphere. They send out the drogue chute first uh, then it uh, trails a smaller uh, chute uh, which uh, begins to slow down the spacecraft. Then the main uh, parachute comes out and the spacecraft is on its way for a slow drop into the Atlantic. Retrofire now should be within about a minute, about 53 seconds, and uh, something like this will be going on in the spacecraft. We can watch this uh, uh, mock-up spacecraft at uh, McDonald. And we're listening to Paul Haney at Mission Control. From Gemini 9. Mark 30 seconds from retrofire. seconds away. Eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Retro fire. Counting up now. Retro 14 seconds from retro fire. We've had no report from Gemini 9. Four good retros. Gene Cernan sung it out. Four good retros. 32, 33 seconds after retro fire. Four good retros. That means the spacecraft has been slowed, has begun its re-entry toward the atmosphere. Roger, say again, you're four. Take it about 20 minutes now. Going to pass across 
Roger, good one. Two nine six. Uh, his incremental velocity indicators show the plan was for two nine eight. He was within two feet of the planned uh, aft reading. His down indicator showed one twenty five. The plan there was one twelve. He's in excellent position. This animation is a little bit uh, behind the fact that uh, retrofire package was actually jettisoned, of course, uh, just a moment after the firing of the retro rockets. We still have no confirmation on retro jettison, the retro adapter itself. Now, Stafford does confirm that the retro adapter has separated. That's what you just saw. Perhaps we were closer to being on time with the animation than I thought. Although the confirmations coming really through the Canton station seem to be coming a little slower than the actual time of events. It was almost 25 seconds after retrofire before we got confirmation, and that was kind of a law in 25 seconds. That, of course, is a critical maneuver to get these men back from space. If those retros don't fire, they're in terrible trouble. About 25 seconds was a long wait. We're two minutes and 13 seconds after retrofire. We're 31 minutes and 42 seconds from splash. And about uh, 17 minutes from uh, the point at which they reached the blackout uh, Over area. Hawaii, Tom Stafford is to give the Hawaii station a detailed estimate on the retro maneuver. He will verify again his IVI readouts, and he will estimate his attitudes during retro fire. He will also advise us whether it was an auto or an automatic or a manual retro fire. We suspect it was an automatic. The retro fire thrust uh, was a little bit below nominal. The Position spacecraft sounded like it was pitched down a little. It could mean a slight difference uh, in the position of landing. Any uh, abnormality like that will change the flight path in and perhaps move that footprint we've been talking Three about minutes, a little bit. 26 seconds since retro fire. It's certainly and not no serious. Additional no. conversation. About, uh, Hawaii should acquire the spacecraft uh, in approximately 20 seconds. They're still uh, flying through space. This is a scene from the WASP as they warm up the helicopters to go out and stand by for the splashdown. Do some 30 minutes from now. About 15 minutes from now, the spacecraft will be at the 400,000 foot level where it's generally considered that the atmosphere begins, where it becomes thick enough so that it is noticeable. Blackout begins two minutes after that, as the heat, uh, some 5,000 to 6,000 degrees on the heat shield. CERN advises that the post-retro checklist has been completed. The post-retro checklist is complete. We're not certain whether that communication came via Canton or Hawaii. He should be moving out of the Canton acquisition area. And we are likely communicating with uh, the spacecraft, or will be via Hawaii. Just shortly before that uh, retrofire, they updated the retrofire sequence times out of Houston and have now made splashdown time 10.01 and five seconds. One minute later than... Now the spacecraft is calculated. over Hawaii. Here's how the conversation is going.